I'll teach you something. Good morning. Good morning. So here we are. This is the first episode of the podcast. Ooh. It's early morning and uh, this might be the one time that we can record because one child is asleep. Uh, <laughs> so no promises on the frequency of these podcasts because we're trying to make them in the quiet moments of life which when you have two kids under the age of five very little yeah, very little time very, very little <laughs> but anyways um so today is what thursday yes we've got one more day until the weekend which is meaningless right now because of this quarantine yeah it's like let's uh let's go out and do nothing a little vacation in the dining room or possibly in the in the office you have vacation coming up soon where we're absolutely going nowhere and doing nothing which is great yeah i was supposed to take some vacation in may and just canceled it meaninglessly because like there's no point but my company is forcing us to take our vacation because they don't want basically the pandemic to end and the whole company to go on vacation and shut down entirely. So we're being forced to take a little bit of it, which I think is, you know, reasonable. So, yeah, uh, my company just laid me off. <laughs> <laughs> so I've had a vacation vacation. <laughs> Woo! I like their policy. And I wouldn't <laughs> mind that myself. Um, but yeah, so I think, I don't know, I'm ready. I am ready to teach you something. Oh yeah, like. uh, so. I'm all ears because we've talked about this, um, you know, the buildup of, of this recording, and you have not shared what you were going to teach me. So it's a complete one hundred percent surprise to well, me. There's no point in me teaching you something and then fake teaching you something. Well, so. you could at least outline where you're going, <laughs> but you know, I'm all ears. So this is one hundred percent unscripted. And I will be able to, uh, I don't know, ho hopefully have some sort of visceral reaction to what you're going to teach me. So let's I, have at it. <laughs> thank you for the theater theory. Um, yeah, I have no professional training. So me neither. <laughs> I'm just going to talk. Um, so what I want to teach you about is that phrenology is dumb, basically. <laughs> because <laughs> you know that I hate pseudoscience and so I wanted to talk a little bit about where phrenology came from and the craziness of phrenology so for those of you who don't know phrenology is this bizarre concept that you're able to both um, visually look at a skull or feel a human head um, the different bumps and grooves and shaping of the skull and you're able to take that knowledge and make assumptions on people's personality uh their their different like moral traits <laughs> ethical traits social behaviors cultural practices you can make you know um assumptions about them because of their skull so wow. yeah <laughs> so like you know obviously this has been connected to um psychology unfortunately um this you know all started like all great things in the um early 19th century so the way that i got interested in this subject and where i learned about it um was actually from one of our favorite museums, the Mütter Museum. So Yes, beautiful museum. For those of you who don't know, the Mütter Museum is a museum that's associated with um, the Medical College of Philadelphia, I believe. Yes, um, yes. And they, they have um, a huge collection of artifacts that used to be used for teaching medicine, and they're now like a public gallery. Um Although a lot of medicine is still taught there because oh, they, they have, you know, <laughs> examples of all of the, you know, crazy conditions like the human, soap lady. <laughs> yeah. And human horns and all that. But yeah, I won't get into that. That's a whole other um, subject. But one of the features that they have there that's that they're really well known for is this large um, exhibit called the Grinning Wall. And it's actually a collection of 138 human skulls that was sold to the museum um, by um, uh, Dr. Joseph Hurdle. 
or Joseph Hurdle, I guess. Um, so he was a Viennese um, doctor and a Roman Catholic, and basically he he started collecting these skulls with the distinct purpose of fighting the arguments um, against phrenology. He didn't believe it. He didn't like the associations that were being made by his earlier kind of contemporary who who was... <coughs> that's a baby. That's a baby sneeze. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so he, he had an earlier contemporary um, named um, Franz Joseph Gall. And so Gall is literally like the the beginning. He he's the I would say the leader of phrenology. His followers were called phrenologists, and he was the person who um, began collecting skulls. So this all connects to something called physiognomy, and um, something else basically called cranioclepty and cranioclepty is literally the theft of of skulls and collecting skulls from at the time like the people who were really the victims of this obsession with collecting skulls were sort of people who were known for something so that's either famous people in fact the skulls of beethoven and shakespeare have both been stolen mm -hmm. um or it could also be criminals because you know there's this obsession society has with trying to like figure the out the mind of a criminal right and so you know the early version of this was cranioclepty get a hold of their skull apply your you know crazy phrenology concept to it and then you know hopefully you can create some kind of a guide which later on um a guy the last name i think is lavender he he actually did he created this giant tome which is the word for a giant book it was four volumes and it was called the pocket lavender and it was like all of these different images he created were like different sort of drawings of faces and and they mm. would you know you, you'd have like a picture that he would draw and somebody would have like a really big chin and a long nose and underneath it it would say something like watch out for this kind of person <laughs> you know they're likely to steal from you they're going to have a selfish you know like so it it was literally like you know it's like palm reading for the head but also like really badly classifying people like take racism take you know, sort of like eugenics. Yes, absolutely. So phrenology is really problematic. And like, I didn't know a whole lot about it. You know, I, I've only really paid enough attention that I think um, to it that like, you know, I'm very attracted to the visual arts. And so I always think that the phrenology um, diagram of like the head with all these different colors and stuff like it's really cool to like look at but I've never looked into what phrenology is but like you know Gall actually believed that there were 27 separate organs in the brain and that they were all connected to like different personality characteristics so like it was this like bizarre theory and like you know the other problem with this like where this took me is that like you know all of this body snatching kind of stuff that was going on was really bad and then when um you know hurdle decided to start collecting skulls to fight these people who he was criticizing for their methods of like taking people's skulls mm. he unfortunately started to do the same thing and and like he kind of became just as bad as those people as it relates to like the way that they would get these things like there was theft medical students were taking things and he had people getting you know skulls for him and and you know like this is all like body snatching you know unfortunate behavior from every scientist involved um but that also sort of leads the conversation into like what's to become of collections like this so the Muter museum has actually taken quite a bit of criticism about you know displaying these kinds of things especially now that they're no longer a specifically medical facility they're a public facility yeah. and they actually did buy them i forget for how many like rubles but like they, they specifically were purchased um yeah so i mean i i don't know i'm not really caught up in all that like histrionic stuff but i think it's interesting because you know there's an ethical debate about like the display of those kind of things that were taken under really bad circumstances anyways um well that's how a lot of medical science actually advanced yeah especially you know from the terms of the renaissance like you know basically indigenous uh bodies were yeah. taken and studied 
Well, Sometimes I mean, alive, even, even still alive. That we've gained from the Holocaust. You yeah. know, it's like it's all really dark history. But I think you know you don't. You maybe you don't just like. I don't know, you don't not take the knowledge that was taken yeah. forcefully anyways. You don't throw the knowledge away. Um, you know, you wouldn't go to those measures today, obviously. But, um, you know, I just, I don't know, I think it's an interesting conversation. But, like, yeah. you know. So, yeah, the takeaway is that, like, you know, <laughs> phrenology is nonsense. And that was my dog <laughs> snort coughing or something. So <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, the funny thing is, it's like, the first when you said phrenology, you know, the funniest thing popped in my head. And this is the first knowledge I ever had of the word phrenology. And it was from the movie Men at Work, starring Emilio Estevez and Charlie Sheen, where they were both trash men. Okay, that got... sounds like you're kind of blockbuster. (laughs) It's a funny movie, trust me. But they mentioned phrenology in that movie, and I actually brought up the quote because I remember... The movie, that's the first thing that pops in my head. And uh, Carl says to James uh, in Men at Work, he says, what does a phrenologist feel and interpret? And he says, the size of Walt's asshole. <laughs> Which is basically, Walt was their manager, uh, their trash man manager <laughs> in the movie. But that was my f- first uh, exposure to the word phrenology. You just made this podcast totally not child friendly. <laughs> Well, Although I well, kind of anticipated that, just not so quickly. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I kind of knew a little bit of ph- phrenology. That was my first exposure to it. But like, I remember, you know, we 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 like to antique a lot, mm-hmm. and I remember seeing, I mean, almost every antique mall you ever go to, you'll see this white porcelain head, head yeah. with all these little marks on the sides of the head that apparently, you know, these are your emotional centers or something in your in your brain according to, to phrenology which is basically like palm reading for the head mm-hmm. from what it sounds like and you know it's like it's part of our history i don't think why would you want to be mad at the Mudra museum for collecting oh, these for skulls sure. yeah. it's like it is a part of our history and it's mm-hmm. a part of how we learn things you know it's you know we should not be ashamed of that if we don't acknowledge that kind of stuff we're doomed to do it again correct mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I could take that away. Yeah. Thank you for teaching me something. You're welcome. So, um, I guess it's my portion now of, uh, this podcast. Uh, so the thing that I researched, uh, we did discuss a little bit previously. Mm -hmm. Um. You're not as dark and mysterious as I am. No. No, I wasn't (laughs) dark and mysterious about what I was going to share. But uh, I had to narrow it down because it was so vast. And one of these things which I'll have to learn about this, uh, you know, get better at uh, as we record these podcasts is just to try to get more specific. Mm -hmm. So um, my thing that I'd like to teach you is we can invest in burial plots. (laughs) What? Burial plots are a solid and sound investment. Think about it, okay? Okay. We are good followers of um, Caitlin Doty. I don't know. Mm. Uh, YouTube, uh, ask a mortician fame. Uh, She's a... She's a... She's a mortician. A, yeah, she's an ethical mortician who has yes. her own funeral home. Um, and she's the author of several books. Um, and, yeah, she basically works with families to do more natural hands-on burials of their loved ones for... Um, a sensible cost and good ethics. Yeah, and uh, her, it's death positivity movement, I think, is one mm-hmm. of the big things that she carries. But uh, one thing she hasn't talked about... The art of the good death, I believe. Yeah, I, I was researching that the fact that you can actually buy cemeteries, okay? Right, well, I know, like, we looked at a house while we were going to buy a Well, it was church, a church, yeah. And it had a cemetery attached, so, yeah. Yeah, I was looking into that, and I was like... Why would anyone want to buy a cemetery? I personally would love to buy a cemetery. <laughs> like, seriously, in this time of, like, COVID-19, that's the only place that we've been walking around with our toddler. Because it's, it's fenced in. <laughs> they can't escape. And, you know, you're safer among the dead right now than the living. So, like... Yes, that's ultimately you know, true, I mean, yes. Like, I grew up that way. Like, I love cemeteries. I think they're the most peaceful, natural, nice environments to be in. So... Mm-hmm. 
I would totally love to have my own cemetery. So, so yes. And I looked into this, and trust me, the world of cemetery business is crazy. I mean, it sounds like a lot of shyster type people. Oh, definitely. Know. Definitely. But, I mean, a lot of cemeteries are owned by churches and also funeral homes and things like that. But municipalities. Like, I know yeah, municipal there's been a recent, like, weird thing that's happened in my hometown because the county I grew up in has sold some of the cemeteries to a company that does maintenance. And over the winter, one of them removed a bunch of the family's personal, like belongings that they left on the gravestones and they were really upset about it but it was like a maintenance activity and yeah but which which led me to the the idea of like why would you buy a cemetery and it turns out that there's lots of money to be had okay cemeteries themselves are real estate when you boil down to the thing i mean there's dead bodies in the ground but it's real estate do they sell for like a little less than what normal property does or for more it, or... it depends it depends on the area where you have a cemetery where land is a premium cemeteries are awfully expensive in fact you know owning a plot in a cemetery is like owning a piece of real estate a piece of real estate in an area like in an area that we live in where real estate is super hot you can find burial plots can cost you anywhere from as low as five hundred dollars for the smallest plot for like a cremation urn up to or if you want to like cram somebody into like <laughs> well that's another thing but you can literally spend millions of dollars for a plot of land to bury yourself or your family in okay <laughs> luxury and this is the thing okay burial plots if you want to invest in property Okay, and you don't have the money to invest into a whole property, maybe consider buying burial plots. If you can spend two thousand like dollars today, multiple, so I could put a part of my body in like ten different plots. Well, there's different <laughs> there's different options, right? You can buy you can buy a double uh, what is it a double depth plot. It's like or... a trailer park. You can have a double wide. <laughs> yeah, you can have a double wide, a single wide. Infant plots even cost less. But get this, okay? I looked on Kijiji, okay, for burial plots, okay? Kijiji is like a sales site in well, Canada. At least somebody's giving Kijiji some business during this time. <laughs> well, there's lots of business going on in Kijiji right now because <laughs> a lot of, a lot of people are not working and a lot of people don't care for social distancing, but that's a whole other thing. But I saw on Kijiji 12 plots, 12 burial plots in a popular toronto cemetery how much do you think this person was selling 12 burial plots I mean, for it's toronto so it will be ridiculous um give me a guess 12 plot, let's say one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Two hundred and eighty nine thousand dollars for 12 burial plots in a cemetery See, I was in toronto be like, okay a thousand bucks a plot. okay this person i guarantee you had these plots in his family or his or her family oh, yeah because they buy them early on like i think my parents bought like well when my grandparents died my parents like they bought a double mm. plot or something so they could all be buried together which i guess is my one day that's my problem <laughs> at some point so i gotta make sure that happens um so yeah they own their own plot which it's like you know i don't know i was trying do you creepy. know how much they paid no, I mean, probably in the hundreds. It's a small cemetery in a small town. Um, and, and like my, um, I don't know, it's always creepy me when I go there because like, I don't go often, but I do go sometimes and I see my grandparents, you know, and then my parents' names have been engraved there too, except their, <laughs> their end dates haven't been engraved. And it's like, thanks, instant mortality reminder. Um, yeah. But <laughs> they probably spent basically a couple of hundred dollars for those plots yeah if they sold those plots today i guarantee you since they're in the area that they're in they they have raised the value okay hey man, they live in like the capital of the world for <clears throat> airbnb we should totally flip them like, let's flip these plots <laughs> exactly i mean 
if you want to become like a property brother, right, you have to re renovate, you know, your kitchens or your living rooms. You got to tear up the flooring, all that. <laughs> Buying cemetery plots, okay, in areas uh, where real estate is will shortly become a big premium, like where we live, mm-hmm. okay, you can actually make money off that. I mean, I was reading that <clears throat> you can get returns, excuse me, mm-hmm. uh, of almost 8% return on your investment year over year, depending better, on where it is. Better than the banks are offering these days. Better than what the banks are offering <laughs> in a savings account. I mean, less volatile than the, than, than the stock market, because guess what? People are going to die. <laughs> Everyone's not, everyone dies, right? And I was reading in funeral industry uh, websites you know, there's two peoples that that the two kinds of people that buy plots: the people that plan ahead, and the people that need it immediately for someone that has just passed away. And if anyone knows, and if you watch uh, Ask a Mortician, Kate and Doty, funeral costs can be as as expensive or more expensive than a wedding. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> a wedding and reception. You know, you have to to think of it like a casket costs you thousands of dollars. And, uh, you know, you have to pay for vaults and all sorts of other things. So to, to consider buying a burial plot now, we can make potentially thousands of dollars 40 years from now, 20 years from now. (laughs) So hoarding plots. I'm not saying hoarding plots. I don't want, I don't want to become a slumlord of burial plots, but you could potentially be one. I mean, how many cemeteries do you know uh, pop up every year? It's like, it's not really a thing. Most cemeteries are getting abandoned, let alone being started up again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so as land becomes a premium, you know, as more people inhabit you know, the I earth. Honestly, I am half invested in just buying a bunch of plots in a cemetery so that I have a peaceful place to just go have a picnic and not be bothered. You know what? I don't know if well, you could probably ask the caretaker of a cemetery if you could put a picnic table <laughs> or you could just have a I'll build a stone one. Maybe a campsite. <laughs> like just just buy eight units, you know, that's good I mean, enough yeah, for a there, tent. There is no limit to the obnoxiousness of Airbnb type experiences. Let's do this. You know what? Death Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why not? You want to be buried in New York, you know, for a couple of months and then get buried in Florida for the rest of the year? Yeah. Why not? The snowbird experience. (laughs) The dead, the dead snowbird experience. But anyways, I thought that was fascinating. It's cool. And I would like to, you know, I thought that was something I'd like to teach you. That's very cool. (laughs) So I guess that, you know, we should wrap it up because I'm pretty sure any moment this... There's already a baby coughing, and there's going to be a toddler <laughs> shouting for 30 different kinds of cookie, toast, milk, or what have you real soon. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, to those listening, thank you for hanging out and listening yeah, to you. us. Uh, and if you like what you're hearing, um, we are available on Spotify, um, Anchor. Anchor FM, um, Apple Podcasts. Um, yeah, so if you look for us and you can't find us, uh, let me know. Um, uh, and thanks for hanging out. Yeah, please. Please uh, come and see us again. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good day. All right. Bye-bye. I taught you something. <laughs>